Our prayer in Jerusalem to the Western Church, eh, Brother Jeff, has been, Lord, would you wake up the church in America? Hey everybody, welcome back to The Pursuit. Jeff Hutchin here with John Saborov, and we're excited. We've got a really cool guest that's going to be joining us today, and I can't wait to get into it because we've got some cutting-edge information that's happening around the world. That's one of the things we really try to do here with The Pursuit is we try to record our episodes very close to the date that they're actually going to air, mm -hmm. so we're relevant, right, with, with topics that are going on around the world. So relevant, in fact. I mean, we were just talking off air uh, with our guest, and we, we discovered that something just happened that we're going to be talking about today. I mean, it's like fresh, hot off the presses. That's it's right. Like. That's right. We're excited about that. But before we get to our guest, let me introduce to you our presenting sponsor for today's episode. Whether you're buying, selling, or refinancing, or building your dream home, you have a lot riding on your loan officer. I tell you, a quality professional is necessary for navigating frequently changing market conditions and complex mortgage programs. But this is all made easy when working with our friends over at Premier Home Loans, You've worked with them. It, that that mortgage loan business is a mystery to me. And you're right, it does change on a daily basis. And I'd rather have somebody that knows a heck of a lot more about it than I do to navigate me through, which they just did about a month ago. You so. bet. And we're going to be using them here soon on yep. another on another purchase. So uh, the group over at Premier Home Loans is absolutely incredible. They're a family-driven operation. And you can be confident that Premier's ultimate goal is to ensure that you make the right choice for you and your family. So check them out. You can find them at premierhomeloansco.com, premierhomeloansco.com. Well, let's get in, and I want to introduce um, our special guest to you today. Uh, his name is Stephen Corey, and Stephen is the president of, it's called Holy Land Missions, based out of Jerusalem and Bethlehem. He happens to be in the United States right now, so we were able to grab him and say, Stephen, come join us on the show. A little bit about his mission in this ministry it started back in 1979. And it really, it, it, it can be traced back to he and his family as they were raised in this area in Jerusalem and Bethlehem. It came out of a passion for the people there, the lost people in, in Israel. And those are people like the Arabs and, and the Jews and, and others I'm sure that Stephen's gonna talk about that they've been ministering to. An incredible ministry, incredible work that's been going on. And there's about a thousand different things that we could talk about today. But uh, we picked a few, and we'll see where the, the Spirit takes us today. So without further ado, let's bring out our guest. This is Stephen Corey. Stephen, welcome to The Pursuit, my man. Thank you, brother Jeff and John. Thank you for having me. I'm blessed. I'm honored. And we say shalom and salam and greetings. Amen. Amen. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit about, let's unpack what you've got going on in the ministry right now. What are you guys working on? What are you doing there? And, and what are you excited about right now as it relates to your mission? Um, so a lot is happening. And the most exciting thing is we're seeing many Muslims, their desire to really want to learn more about Jesus. Uh, their desire to want to understand the truth about the Bible. And that is a great sign of not only the end times, but this is a great sign for a beginning of a possible revival. Mm. And we see Jewish people and Muslim people, um, they're seeing visions and dreams. Uh, they're, seeing, uh, they're seeing things, uh, images out of the Bible that would have happened 2,000 years ago. What does that do to somebody like myself, who is a Jerusalem-born believer, who has seen much persecution and much suffering over the years for representing the message of Jesus? What it does to me, it gets me more excited to be a light in a dark world. And that is what's happening right now, where the world is in chaos. The believers are being used by God as a beacon of light. Let's talk a little bit about the, the, the presentation of the gospel to these specific people groups, the Muslims and the Jews. What, what is the, where do you start? Where does the conversation begin when you begin to talk about your faith? That's a great question. Uh, it's a relationship, relationship, relationship. And what that means is 
when you talk to a Muslim, you're not talking to an agnostic or an atheist or a person that's into Scientology or science or, or, or worship of ancestry. You're, you're, you're talking to a Muslim and a Jew who their religion is their identity. It's ironic because you'll have many Muslims or many Jews who are um, secular uh, or they're atheistic Jews or, or secretly, secretly atheistic Muslims. But yet they, they attach a religious identity to their philosophical beliefs. So you're, when you go with a Muslim and a Jew to build the relationship, you're not going against a theology only, nor are you going only against a, a, a conviction. You're going against their identity. And so that to flush through the identity requires relationship built on love, trust. Uh, they want to see, you'll talk about Jesus' victory. You have Jesus and hope, hope in Jesus. Then when they watch your life, they better see hope. Uh, when you talk about victory in Jesus and they see your life, they better see some victory in Jesus because if they don't, then you're just, you're just selling them an empty bag. So talk to us, talk to us about, uh, if you would, your approach. So do you have, do you have many people that are part of your staff? In, in what ways do you conduct outreaches to these people groups? Um, t talk a little bit about the process. Sure. Uh, sure, Jeff. It's a great, great question. So uh, Holy Land Missions, that's our 501c3 in America. It's a stateside nonprofit organization, but really 90 percent of what we do is overseas in Israel. Uh, whatever we, little we do in America, it's more for uh, traveling, speaking, financial accountability as a platform. So over there in Israel, amongst the Arabs and amongst the, the Jewish people, what Holy Land Missions does is we do outreach programs where we utilize Easter, Christmas, uh, Ramadan, which is the Muslim holiday. We, we utilize the Jewish feast, the Jewish high feast. There's over there's over 14 of them, and there's seven major uh, Jewish high holidays. And we utilize these atmospheres and these celebrations uh, to build a bridge with them, whether it be uh, doing a, a Christmas event, feeding two, 3,000 people at a nice, fancy sit-down dinner, and then sharing the gospel message with them and building that relationship with them. Uh, that leads into us going to their homes. And once we go to their homes, then now you're entering their domain. You, you, you've transcended the, the whole context of being just cordial. Hi, how are you? Have a good day. Now you're in their home. Now you talk deeper into what hope looks like. So uh, then, of course, you have one-on-one -on -one discipleship training. Uh, so Holy Night Missions over there, what we have is we have over 11, 12 ministries in the country of Israel, both on the Jewish side and on the Arab Muslim side. So which includes churches above the ground. We actually have, uh, Jeff and John, we have an underground church movement as well. Underground is Muslims that have accepted Jesus Christ or people that are secretly being baptized or what? So we have a movement for them. We have a safe house for them because many that accept Christ they suffer. They face a, they face a, they face a, a death threats or beatings or what be it. Um, so that's the approach we take. Outreach programs, which leads into sitting down one on one. So that that shows you that it's it's beyond just getting on YouTube or sitting in a platform on a, on a church pulpit and pulpit and preaching. Um, it's it's hands on. So they want to make sure that you're there around them. So it's relationship based. So that's why it's very important for us to have centers and movements and our centers and our communities are looked at as an emergency place. So basically our church, where churches in other countries are shut down because of this COVID, for example, or emergency state, but because we've registered as an emergency community, we actually can open our doors during a time of a crisis where others are closed because of the infrastructure we've set up. So you do all this as a platform foundation to be a light when light is needed and to be a Jesus to those that know, know Jesus. It strikes me then in a place like Jerusalem um, that is so polarized, we typically, through the Western lens, we see, you know, Muslim versus Jew and just the, the, um, the taking of sides and taking up arms against each other. But you're actually describing, and when we think of the underground church, I know the first place I think of is what, China. China. But, uh, but there's this underground movement, uh, even in Jerusalem, among Muslims, as you're saying, who are getting saved. Are they becoming your best evangelists? Slowly they are because 
it, what happens to a lot of them is uh, to those who the eyes are really opened up, they sort of start to build a somewhat a, a sort of an animosity towards something that they feel they've been imprisoned by. And a lot of times they get to a point where you sometimes see so much passion <laughs> in them. It, it sometimes comes across as there's hatred in their hearts for, for Islam and, and, and for the prophet of Islam. And we sort of, as believers, have to sort of help rail them back and help them balance their emotions. So we understand that you feel like you've been in prison and blinded all these years, but you're not going to win anybody. We'll tell them, how did we win you over? Well, let's say love, forgiveness, grace, charity, being there for, we said, we want you to be the same thing and not, not be the other end of hatred, animosity towards your old uh, tradition. So we don't use the word like conversion or change your religion because these words are trigger words that really um, they put a lot of anger. I always use the context of Acts when Paul was going to, to Damascus to, he's got letters in his hands to, to, to beat, attack, behead, and, and burn down churches in Damascus. And, of course, we know Christ, uh, the Lord, appears to him. And, of course, he puts him in a cloud. And, and I always tell people, go back and read your scripture. You've always, you've always heard it, Paul's conversion to Damascus. He, he wrote, you know, Paul's wrote a journey to conversion. It actually never says he converted. I actually had the privilege to, to do a whole preaching on this, a teaching on this series. It says, Paul saw the light. There's a big difference between the two. He, he saw the light, the light drew him. And I always tell people when I was age 16, uh, 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 John, when I was age 16, I was one of my first young Muslims to lead to Christ. Uh, his family physically beat me and attacked me, attacked me, beat me to the ground. And I remember I, in the middle of this vicious beating, of beating to the ground, I said, Lord, just get me through this beating. It's painful. It's metal chains and wooden sticks. And I remember I shouted, Lord, get me out of this. And, and I remember I, I, when I said, Lord, when I said, Lord, get me out of this, I'll do more. I'll serve you more. I tell people I literally felt like just a white, just a white blanket just draped over my body. And I understood at that moment what the psalmist was saying when the psalmist said, even if I lay my bed in the pit of hell, thou art there with me also. I understood what it meant, there's no place too low for the presence of God to appear. There's no place too high for the presence of God to appear. And they picked me up and they put me in this dumpster and they spray paint on this trash, on this big dumpster. Look at this Christian. May he be an example. And they're trying to use me as an example to the community that if you talk about Jesus, this is your outcome. But I tell people that beating made me the man I am today because it wasn't that beating. I would not appreciate Christ as much as I do. I would not appreciate and cherish my relationship with him because he was there in the middle of that beating and that taught me what it means to be a light to the to, to the dark world that that it's not about conversion it's about it's about seeing something i believe in and i follow that light and then in that process i become a light to, to to others around me and that is what we do today in bethlehem and in jerusalem it, it, and their intention was to create hatred in my heart for other Muslims so that I'll never share the gospel with them. But it backfired. <laughs> so it created a beast out of me for the, for the gospel. And, you know, I sit down with Muslim businessmen. I sit down with Muslim entrepreneurs, with even, even with Hamas leaders, even with Muslims that I know down deep. They want to just behead me on the spot. But I've, and I give 101% glory to God. And, and I've found a way to sit down with them and build a relationship with them and show them that I'm not, I'm not afraid, but I'm confident. But at the same time, I love them enough where I'm willing to risk my life. And that's what being a light in a dark world is all about. You know, I, your example of Paul, I think about, you know, once, once he saw the light, and I appreciate your perspective saying that uh, it's not a conversion, but he actually saw the light. But, but once Paul saw that light, he became a warrior for the kingdom and I would guess in what I hear in your voice is, is when a Muslim who finds their identity in their religion sees the light, my guess is their commitment and their sellout factor to the message of the gospel is, is great. We could learn a lot. Can, can I add this? Say that. You, and, you and I have talked about, there's a scripture that says that I'd rather you be hot or cold. The lukewarm, thinking the same thing. He'll spew out of it. Thing. And sometimes, and the challenge is that for people out there that may have relatives, friends that seem the furthest away from God, and they may be in their current condition, 
they may be closer than you can possibly think. And the cool thing is when those people get saved, buddy, they're all in. Mm. It's like our friend Stephen, what happened with him. You think, you know, a, a little mishap or, or um, you know, the loss of a job or going hungry for a day would separate him? <laughs> think about Paul now. Should anything separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus? Mm. No, neither death nor life nor principalities or powers. He's all in. I appreciate that very much. Amen. You know, going back to um, going back to what you guys said, the context of Revelation three is you're neither warm nor neither cold. I'd rather you have be warm or cold. And then the context of Acts nine, which is the journey, which is a journey of uh, Paul to Damascus. It, it's it's they all go in hand in hand because we are living in a day, uh, Jeff and John. We live in day and age where God wants us to make a decision about how we're going to follow Jesus. This does not mean slapping people or smacking people on the head with Bibles. It's just meaning that in, your, in our lives, are we going to be the representation of Jesus on earth till he comes? Or are we just going to be a believers on, on just a Sunday or when we read a scripture on, on, on one day or, or when we watch a Christian movie and get inspired for a few hours? Uh, so in, in the last years, last eight or plus years, I've been had the privilege to come to America, uh, uh, Jeff and John, and I've had the privilege to preach and teach uh, to thousands of people in America through churches and conferences, um, having the privilege and the honor to share platforms with uh, Franklin Graham and sharing uh, on the, the same platforms as VP Mike Pence and, and uh, privileged to speak at the United Nations and, and, and Fox News and all these platforms and and, and, and still God's opening more doors as, 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 as I'm with you right now. And, and my message to America has been prepare for what's to come. Um, be ready because persecution in America and suffering is not going to come just like you would, you know, getting 17, 18 guys lined up at the beach and being beheaded. Or that it, it, in America is going to come a lot different than how it will overseas. And, and those are watching, those are listening, uh, who will be watching, listening this, this coming week. It's... It's regardless of whether your faith is a 10 out of 10 or one out of 10, regardless of where you are in your faith, you've got to make a decision of where you stand. You got to have belief. You got to have foundation. You got to have convictions because it will lead you to, 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 to what's to come. You'll know what you'll know where you stand when somebody pushes you to, to, to express your heart. And the second thing I've been telling people is Jerusalem has to be on the heart and the center of every believer out there it's it's ironic because I'm, I'm gonna read this quickly to you guys and, and i know we talked briefly about this and it's uh i always tell people that uh, jerusalem is the only city where the lord has specifically calls his his own city and i i wrote this a few years ago he calls it by name in psalm 48 8 and daniel 9 19 it's ironic because he calls it his own city it was destroyed several times, attacked over 52 times. Um, it was besieged 23 times. It's captured and recaptured at least 44 times. And yet, he still calls it the city of peace. <laughs> mm. and it's, uh, uh, it's referred to over 800 times. And I always tell people it's possible that we've got the whole context of peace a lot different than uh, than what God really intends to peace. The peace in, his, in, in God's foresight is a lot different than how we foresee it. So maybe if I hear you right, as I think about peace and now I'm thinking about that one of the fruits and gifts of the Spirit is walking in a place of peace independent of our circumstances. Maybe he meant peace in the midst of conflict. 100%. Because when Jesus was saying it, um, in the context of the Beatitudes all the way from Matthew 5, 6, 7, and of course Luke, it's, he's saying it while others around him are planning to deceive him. They're planning because in, in those same reference of chapters, it says, and while the high priests were planning on basically tricking Jesus in public, and we see not too far after that, we see him at the temple. Of course, that's when he gets questioned by the high priest. So he said it in the midst of those around him planning to plotting against him. And I think, there's no better time than right now. And in Jerusalem, um, and in Barry Wallace is, is our mutual friend. I thank God for him. He's the one that connected, connected us together. And I look forward to a growing friendship. But he, him and I have talked a lot about this. And, I, and there is something about Jerusalem. And a, 
our story is, it's, you mentioned it, it's over 41 plus years today, our story in Israel and the Palestinian communities. But our focus has always been in Bethlehem and outside Jerusalem. In the last five, six years, our focus has been the center of Jerusalem because that's where it's all going to happen. And in Jerusalem, in the center of Jerusalem, we've been pushed and kicked out of so many properties there. We rent a property, we outgrow a property, the daughter or son or cousin or nephew or a high Muslim priest, a high Muslim cleric comes to our church community. And so that puts pressures on landlords. So we've been pushed out and kicked out of every rental property in Jerusalem because we share something so unique. It's not us. It's the message of the light of Jesus Christ. And that has led today our ministry to be completely without a home in Jerusalem. Uh, basically, it's, it's a homeless ministry. We're the largest evangelical movement, but we are homeless in Jerusalem. That's the funny part about it. Uh, and yeah, the focus is not on a, on, a, on a building or a property, but to those that understand the history of Judaism, history of, of the Islamic belief system, if they don't see you and identify you as there amongst them, uh, as a place, a house of worship or a leadership training center, because that's what we are. We're a leadership training center. We're a worship center. Uh, we're a community center for the, uh, to do outreaches through. If you're not there amongst them, it, there's no trust. There's no longevity. There's no long-term partnership there. And that's what, well, that's what many in the, in the community that don't like the message of the gospel, that's how they try to sort of dismantle us. We're still standing strong. We're still being a beacon of light in a dark world. And people always ask us, why do you keep coming back to Jerusalem even after you get pushed out and kicked out? And how are you so growing and quadrupling when there's so much persecution on you? We say it's the gospel. It's a lot of Jesus. We give the glory to God, but we are committed to Jerusalem. And because we know things in the Bible that many people don't, that it's, it's the epicenter of the world. Pastor, you were talking about earlier about the, the seasons that the city of Jerusalem and Israel has gone through. And right now, I think one of the things we were talking about offline is, is we can agree that we're in a new season now. This is a, a unique season where things are happening. Unique things are happening. The Spirit of God is moving in ways that at least maybe in our lifetime we have not seen. You were mentioning, briefly mentioned earlier, the Muslims are having visions and dreams. And, and that's certainly one of the signs of the end times. Talk to us about the season in Israel now and, and what you see unfolding. What is the Lord revealing to you? That's such a great question. And it's a, it's a dynamic question. It's a, it's a conundrum because there's so much that goes into it to unpack. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you the shortest version. Um, there has to be someone uh, with that spirit of the Antichrist who, who prepares the platform for a coming person to create an ultimate peace treaty for all sides within Israel, all sides within the Arab Palestinian people that can entice them all to agree to building a, building a temple uh, or at least building a, a, a tent of holy of holies at least is place where they can worship and pray. I'll, I'll tell a lot of people, they don't have to have a full building, blown out building to call it a temple. They, and again, this is a different episode. People have to understand the context of Judaism to understand that a tent with certain things within the tent can qualify as a holy of holies, which the temple becomes where that holy of holies is. So it does not necessarily have to be a full blown decked out to be called a temple. Eventually, it will look like that. But it, for for someone who has the spirit of the Antichrist to sit, he, he could be, it, it, it could be a wooden chair under a tent that is called a temple in the eyes of a Jewish world. So we have to, when we look at the Bible, we have to look at it from a Jewish, Judeo Christian root foundation and not from a Western a, a Christian perspective. We have to separate the two, we have to go back to the roots of that. And I know that's something that we've discussed briefly offline. So what does all this mean? This means that the Middle East has to see a ripple effect. Uh, uh, Middle Eastern Muslim nations have to be, see the benefit, a ripple effect benefit of what a partnership or a peace treaty talk with Israel looks like. Of course, we all know this week, uh, this past week, uh, the United uh, the UAE uh, signed a, a treaty, United Arab Emirates, with Israel, which is, which is historical. Now, you have to understand, behind the scenes, They've been talking, negotiating, talking for months 
It's just now we're seeing it happen. And talks with Sudan and a couple other countries which are going to be coming on the scene. They're going to be coming on the scene with peace talks and treaties. So Sudan today just announced they are welcoming the, the, the negotiation, the talks with the peace treaty. You have to understand, they're welcoming it. They've already talked about it. They already have the text in place. <laughs> they, 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 they put out these little teasers in, in the atmosphere to see the response of other Middle Eastern countries. And, and uh, uh, you know, heed my words, uh, other countries are going to follow. Countries like Dubai and Abu Dhabi and Saudi Arabia, which has been working closely with Israel behind the scenes. Indonesia is going to be coming in, in the coming months. These big, wow. big, um, and most probably also Malaysia. So these countries, now what's going to happen is Iran is not liking this. And this is a fact. So what we're going to see happen is Iran is going to uh, tighten their relationship to a deeper level with uh, Russia and with Turkey and with some of the other countries who see Israel as a threat and see Israel as, a, as, that, as that pinata to, to sort of poke at the United States. So what, what that does is that pushes Iran now to show the world that they are not going to be like the other countries. So most probably we're going to see Iran do something crazy in the coming, in the coming months. Um, uh, to sort of flex their muscles against uh, the West, America, and Israel. Uh, and also it tells the other world that they're, gonna, they're not accepting what is being talked with peace treaties with Israel. What that also does, I'll, I'll share this last thing. The exciting thing this does is this pushes the local community. Now I'm tell, I tell you this, I'm, I'm not somebody living in America. I live in Israel. And people there are tired. The Jewish people are tired. They're fed up. Um, Arabs are tired. They're fed up. Uh, you can tell them. You can tell them a monkey is going to lead the 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 the, the political new uh, uh, regime. They'll say yes to it as long as it brings wealth, money, and power. They'll say yes to anybody leading them. So that means that people are tired. They're they're drawn. They're tired. They're worn out of peace. They're worn out of war. They're worn out of. They're tired of this wave of up and downs, and they just want peace. Of course, they're looking for uh, earthly peace, and. That means anybody with enough power can come on the scene right now and persuade both sides to have a, a, a seven-year talk or what be it, a hudna it's called. Uh, and the hudna is usually seven days or seven months or seven years. It's an Islamic word. Um, so it's, things are coming together. These are exciting times. And coming from a Jerusalemite, my, my encouragement, my warning to believers is to start living for God. Start to prepare for a, a, a dry season, uh, both on earth, uh, but in the spiritual realm, it's a good season, but it's also a season to prepare for the unseen and the unknown. When you speak of a dry season, Pastor, are you talking about the tribulation? Or are you talking about the season leading up to? It, the, the season leading up to. Uh, and I think, uh, I think as believers, we have to, uh, our prayer, in Jerusalem to the Western church, uh, brother Jeff has been uh, Lord. Would you wake up the church in America? Uh, not that we have it all correct in Jerusalem. We have a lot of issues just like every other believing person walking on earth has. Um, uh, and I, I remember I asked that question to the Lord. So Lord, what is, what is the dry season? I asked that Lord this question, Jeff, and here's, here's what the Lord is, is, is shared with me. And this came, it was about two thirty AM in the morning. Um, uh, this is what the Lord said. I, I, I remember exquisitely, we, just, we had a big Muslim outreach going on. I had just had a, a, a meeting, a three-hour meeting with some high-level Muslim cleric. This is an imam, one of the, one of the imams in, in Hebron. And I remember it was 2.30 a.m. in the morning. I'm, I'm reading my notes right now. I remember I, I, it just, the Spirit of the Lord came on me heavy. We had just big outreach. And it said this. It says, Stephen, tell my people in the West and around the world, Repent and confess your sins, and I will answer you. I remember I said, Lord, what do you mean confess your sins? And, it, it, and the message was, this is once in the collective, let's all get together on the 25th of blank day, and let's all get on our knees. No, this was an individual getting in our closet and confessing our sins before God so that when things do come to earth, uh, with a pre-tribulation, mid-tribulation, wherever somebody stands in this eschatological belief system, we are going to taste uh, some kind of drought season from an earthly perspective. 
and and, and but and, and it continues. It's it's not by itself to repent, and, and it says, "I will answer you." So that means it, it, I will answer. That means we have something on our heart, and we repent. God's gonna answer our desires of our hearts, and says, "Thank Him for the bread on the table. And I will give you your desires." And I said, "Lord, what do you mean bread on the table? What does this mean?" And and the response was, "I want my people to be grateful for what little I've given them, and I will I will make them rulers over much." So basically what it means is, Jeff, is that when everything around us is dry, when everything around us is, 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 is being destruction, confusion, fear, what's happening right now? It's, it's a small taste. It says here, I will give you your desires as long as we're grateful for what little God's given us. And, and the third thing was tear down idols and I will show you the future. And I said, Lord, what do you mean idols? And the Lord was silent on this, uh, uh, Jeff and John. It, it, there was no answer. What is this idol? What does it mean? And I think the Lord was silent because every individual has their own uh, idols in their own lives. So we all do have our own idols in our lives. And, and, and it says that tear down the idols. Let God be the first in our lives. Uh, and I think when the dry season comes, whether it be pre-trip, mid-trip, post-trip, wherever eschatologically person stands, it doesn't matter. He's Jesus is coming. Amen? Um, Amen. He's coming. And, but when we do these three things as believers, we rise above the situation around us. And, and we, that's where we goes back to that where we first started, being a beacon of light, focusing on those two things, that persecution, suffering is coming, it's begun, but also focusing on Jerusalem and what are we doing right now to making sure there's a revival starting in Jerusalem. It started in Jerusalem 2,000 plus years ago, and it has to start again. And could we be the moment right now where Holy Land Missions, for example, uh, or many, some of the other few, uh, there's only a few ministries in Jerusalem anyways, um, left who are doing crazy enough to do what we do. Um, could this be the spark, the revival, to help rev spark throughout the world one more time? I believe it could be. This could be it. I, I'm almost <laughs> astounded in disbelief. That's why I'm being so quiet and taking notes and, and thinking about all of this. And you know what occurred to me? That you remember in Matthew 24, it says, unless the days of, of the end, end times were, were shortened, even the elect would be deceived. And, and it strikes me that here we are in the midst of this COVID deal where it's gotten us so worried about us four and no more, right? We are so locked in and focused on, you know, the rights that are being taken away from us in America and all of this that we're almost blind to the things that are happening around the world that are pointing toward the setting up of the end days, whether you believe that's next year or next decade or sometime after that. Um, but... You know what I mean? It, it just, it's just, it's amazing. It's, it's beautiful is what it is. Yeah. And, and Pastor, I, I got to tell you, we, we met you earlier today, uh, but I, I'm just going to tell you right now, you've stolen our hearts. Mm -hmm. And, and you, you have a friend in the pursuit, and we're behind you a thousand percent. And I'm just offering to you anything we can do to help you in your mission and the work that you're doing. You've got us a hundred percent. You need to know that. Um, we're, we're going to be coming to see you real soon in Israel. And I can't wait to sit down and, and, um, and share some bread with you and, uh, and just talk. And, and, uh, man, I'm inspired by you. Uh, you blessed me today. I know you've blessed the people that are listening and watching this, this episode real quickly. If you could just summarize in 30 seconds for us, um, how, how can the Christians, of the West come alongside you and your ministry? What's the way we can bless you the most? Thank, thank you, Jeff and John. I'm humbled. First off, I, I, I love you all. I love you. I love your spirit. I love your heart. Um, I love the church in America. I've dedicated a big part of my life to encouraging the church in America. In fact, I began my speaking tour in America uh, actually in the coming weeks. And I'm, I'm, I'll, be, I'll be traveling throughout the U.S. till the end of November. So one thing you can pray for is if there's pastors that hear this, uh, or lay people or deacons or elders in their church, I'd love to for you to reach out to me. And I, I know Jeff and John, you'll put up my email address on our website mm -hmm. uh, to reach out to my team. I'd love to see if we can plug it into my schedule where I can come and preach or teach um, a, a, into your community. Um, you know, the biggest burden on my heart right now is save, uh, saving the, the, it's called the Landmark Campaign or Saving the Jerusalem Church Campaign, Jeff. We've been kicked out of so many properties in Jerusalem. We made a decision two and a half years ago. We're no longer going to rent. We're going to buy our own property in, Jer in Jerusalem. We are the only Bible-believing, evangelical, uh, uh, you know, sort of an entrepreneurship approach 
to, to, to raising leadership, successful leaders for the future. Um, a, so we're asking Christians in America to consider th if there's any time to stand up for Jerusalem and, and to put a stake in the ground for the coming of the return of the Messiah, it's now more than ever. So we are campaigning on that. People can visit our website to really know about how you can, you can plant a mark in Jerusalem right now. Um, and, and people can look us up on the website. We are 501c3, a tax deductible, tax exempt organization. So uh, my heart goes out to you. The good times are even dry, dry season to the world, but good days to those who, who have the hope in Christ because others around us will be confused and baffled by we, we're successful. God's bringing wealth. He's opening doors. When everything around, I'm talking about the believers, everything around us is going down the drain. Uh, uh, that's going to that's gonna raise some eyebrows. It's going to draw people to us. So that's my thing is pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Stay faithful to the gospel. Um, if, if, if you want to put a mark in Jerusalem right now, we do have an opportunity to, to do so. We have, a, we have a property right now which is being offered to us. We have a 30-day no, uh, no competition uh, clause. Uh, so uh, first right to refusal on a property that's right smack in the middle of Jerusalem. And it would be nice to see it be a beacon of light. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, you, you guys have heard the challenge. Folks, you've heard the challenge. This is an opportunity right here and now to invest in the kingdom uh, in this great work that these guys are doing right in the heart of it. I mean, that, that's, I'll tell you what, I, I've been to Jerusalem. And my wife and I, if you asked her right now, if we brought her in here and asked her, she would say the minute she stepped off the plane, she began to cry because in her spirit, she said, I'm home. I'm home. Man, we love you. We been send blessings to you. Thank you, Stephen, for being on with us. And uh, hey, you've got a friend in the pursuit. This is the first of many conversations and we look forward to it. Blessings to you, my brother. Thank you, everyone, for joining us on The Pursuit. And make sure you go online, check out our website, thepursuitonline.com. Incredible resources available to you out there to hear from men like Stephen and others that have a message uh, for the world. Hit subscribe on their YouTube channel as well. Um, reach out to us. There's an email address, as you said, on, on the website. Um, and we look forward to hearing your feedback. We're, uh, we're all about trying to make this as effective as it can be as a tool to bring the gospel to the world and encourage people to relentlessly pursue truth and transformation. Hey, we'll see you next time on The Pursuit. See ya.